This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Uh, I'm Roger Jelinek, your host on Bookworld, and I, my guest today is Fred Hemmings, uh, who uh, just written a memoir called Local Boy, <laughs> and uh, he certainly is a local boy. Yes. Uh, let's. Uh, I don't think I've ever met anyone who has taken such full advantage of Hawaii as you have. But, so uh, let's tell everyone about it. You were, you were, where did you come from originally? I mean, you were born here? Born here January 9th, 1946. Your parents came from somewhere? Or? No, actually, my mother was born here. Her <laughs> grandmother came from uh, Funchal, Madeira, a uh, Portuguese oh. island in the, in the Atlantic. Right. And my dad came here in 1927 from New York City. So on my mother's side, I'm actually fifth generation. And why did your dad come from New York City? He His father, know? believe it or not, was one of the first men involved are in the Navy flying boats and uh, Navy, oh. Navy, Naval aviation. So he came to Pearl Harbor uh, to work on airplanes. He was a good mechanic. Oh, do you know this, the story of the guy that first flew across the Pacific? You know that? The uh, Rogers, the, the airport yeah, used to be named, named after? after the, yeah, John yeah. Rogers Airport, John right? John Rogers, yeah. yeah. That's a pretty amazing story. Yeah. We'll, the, we'll get back to that. Uh, so uh, uh, always on Oahu? Or? Born and raised in Oahu. Uh, I, I've I'm in love with Hawaii, and I've made a point, uh, I think being intimate with something you love, knowing it well, is what I interpret intimate to be. I've made an effort to uh, really put my feet on the ground of all parts of Oahu. So I've seen the sun come up from the top of Haleakala. I've, you know, I've been cold, uh, the snow goddess Poliahu on the top of Mauna Kea. I've ridden the waves of all the shorelines. I've run through the lava fields of uh, Kona. Uh, I've paddled a canoe. Uh, Across Hanalei Bay, uh, down to Hanakapi uh, Did uh, you have a bucket list, or did you have a checklist? No, I just, just have a. Just, I, just did it. I have a mental list, and as yeah. time goes on, uh, yeah. you know, I was heavily into jogging for a while, yeah. so I'd end up going with buddies. Uh, uh, one buddy in particular who was a dear friend, and we just decided to go run places. We've run the the, the what they call the King's Trail on the lava fields across Kona. Right. Uh, believe it or not, we ran through Haleakala, which was two hours and 46 minutes of absolute misery. <laughs> but we did it. You did it. Yeah. Yeah. But you got out alive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Sometimes I've been there at dawn and then look oh, around and you see it's an incredible sight. And you see all these huddled figures in their hotel yeah. blankets. <laughs> well, I got to tell you a funny story because yeah. we went up there to run yeah. and I didn't think about how cold it was being we you know we got jackets on and stuff so we started running and I think once your body warms up you'll be all right yeah. so I had shorts and a shirt on and we weren't all right, right. it was cold right. it was cold yeah, yeah. Did you stay overnight or did you... uh, we, we stayed at Kula Lodge and yeah. we, uh, our wives took us up there at um, uh, 5 30 in the morning we watched the sun come well, up and I then we it's very cold at 5 30 oh boy I'll tell you yeah. it was but it gets very hot in the middle of the day no, uh, not, the not the in the middle is, of the career. It gets it gets warmer, but yeah. uh, hot's but not a word. The sun is intense, but the sun is intense, yeah. but not hot. Yeah, I'll yeah. tell you what was intense, Roger. It was it was rather rather curious. I didn't realize it until I read it years later. Is the how quiet the interior of the crater is, and they say they say, and I don't know if this can be validated. That it's one of the most quiet places on Earth because there's no sound. You know, the, it's like a bowl. It's like a bowl, yeah, and and yeah, and. Yeah. There's no sound in the crater, and the sides of the crater are, are pretty remote until you get to the very top where the lookout is. But other than that, there's it, they, so it's a very quiet place and very spiritual, uh, as I think, as a result. You know, it's, it's nature's as a way of grabbing you. Yeah, well, it's a very special place. It is. Yeah. So you grew up, uh, where did you grow up as a boy? Actually, uh, uh, it's rather curious. Uh, uh, I. It, I came from a house of modest means. We weren't a wealthy family. And so I grew up in Kahala, and people thought, oh, you must have had some money. You know, Kahala's considered a gold plated neighborhood or one so of them. That's where all the pigs were raised. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When I was there, it was pig farms. Uh, yeah. they were, <laughs> the paved roads were Kahala Avenue and Aokai and Kealoholo, and uh, the rest of Kahala was pig farms and, and you know, agriculture. They, they, you know, they were mostly Japanese farmers, and we were on Farmer's Road. It was a dirt road, and we had a, th a three acre uh, ag lot. How long did it take to get downtown? Oh, back then it took, yeah. uh, you know. Took how did you get downtown? Well, you, you went on Wailai Road. Yeah. Wailai Road yeah. weaved its way up through uh, Kamaki, uh, or you could, you know, go down to Waikiki and weave your way that way. But usually you go to Wailai Road and you go through Kamaki and then down 
uh, around St. Louis High School and then uh, down. And uh, high, but Kaimuki then was country, wasn't it? Or, or, or no, no, no. Kaimuki had, had developed, and Wilhelmina Rice had houses yeah. on it. it, 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 it Kaimuki was a lot more de developed than Kahala was in the, yeah. in the 50s when I was a young boy, early 50s. And uh, uh, Europe, well, everybody knows you as a famous surfer. Uh, <laughs> that when now did, means, when oh, did you start surfing? <clears throat> I, I got my first surfboard when I was eight. Um, you know, I, I grew up on the beach of Waikiki, and you know, I was rolling around in the waves ever since I could remember. But I actually got my first surfboard when I was eight years old, and uh, developed a real fine relationship with with the ocean and, and surfing and canoe paddling. And and uh, did you learn it by yourself, or were you? You know, back then, that's you know, my dad uh, uh, made sure that I could swim well yeah. before he let me go out on the board, which I could. And uh, yeah, you learn that back then. No one took you out and said, "Okay, here's what you do." You, you, it was an osmosis thing. You, you, you just suck it up. But were the were the Beach Boys still very much? Oh, active it was, then? It, yeah. I like to call the '50s the romantic yeah. era of Waikiki, yeah. the old Beach Boys. Yeah. And there's something curious about that. I'm glad you asked because um, there's very few pure Hawaiians now, and that's something I think about culturally. Yeah. You know, we want to preserve the Hawaiian culture, and there's a lot of things we can do affirmatively. We're, not, we're certainly not going to preserve the Hawaiian culture by protesting anything. Mm -hmm. But the way we can preserve it is make sure we preserve those things that are endemic to Hawaii. You know, the food, the culture, the, the lifestyle, the, some of the most important you know, places. But we're uh, getting rid of the Hawaiian blood. I mean, there's very few pure Hawaiians. But the culture itself is actually very much alive uh, with... Uh, I run this Hawaii Book and Music Festival, and we have a dedicated oh, sure. venue. And actually, the action is in books because of the immersion programs. You've now had a steady stream of uh, young Hawaiian scholars who get books published because it's part of their professional thing. The books are not that uh, readable, frankly, so we surround them with panels. But they have fascinating information. Yeah. Well, I, I give them a lot of credit. The young yeah. Hawaiians yeah. are doing a lot. They're, they're, yeah. I think the, cult, the seeds of the cultural renaissance uh, were planted by Herb Connie, Tommy Holmes, and uh, Ben Finney, yeah. the, the anthropological uh, anthropology professor at the university, and that was with the Hokulea. That really kindled a Hawaiian Renaissance, yes. and everybody decided, well, you know, we we can bring back from near extinction this voyaging society concept. That you know, how profound it was. I, I haven't been. I've only been here since '92, and at that time there were maybe. 500 kids under the age of 21 who could speak Hawaiian, oh. and now they're more like 30,000. Yes. So it's it's uh, it's an impressive renaissance. You know. Yes, it is, and and, and uh, they're even getting so sophisticated they're finding out uh, the Hawaiian language got adulterated uh, because when uh, the missionaries got here in 1820, they didn't have the written language, right. and Hiram Bingham was actually the one that took the sounds and gave them letters. But in that translation, there were a lot of things that were lost, as I understand it. Right. I'm by no, no means a linguist. But uh, uh, I understand that the, the young Hawaiians now are a lot more articulate and knowledgeable of the language than you know, generations ago. Well, there's a lot more material about that culture out yes, available sir. now. Yeah. Well, there's also some really wonderful books from the, uh, the middle of the 1800s. Uh, yeah. Sam Kamakau wrote yeah. a book about ancient Hawaiians. Yeah. I recommend everyone read it, most especially young Hawaiians, to find out what the culture was really like. When you were growing up, did you have Hawaiian friends? Oh, well, sure. Yeah? Sure. Well, yeah, um, well, I was a surfer, so yeah. all the Beach Boys, when I was a young kid, all the Beach Boys, and this is what I was trying to relate to, most of the Beach Boys in that day, uh, Rabbit Keikai, uh, Steamboat Mokawahi, uh, uh, and all the rest of them, they were pure Hawaiians. You're yeah, funny you mentioned Rabbit, because my wife came here as a kid on a vacation, and he taught her how to surf. And uh, a couple of years ago, she was in a, in a hospital here for some a Kaiser, yeah. I think. And she saw this guy in a wheelchair. And it, on the back of his wheelchair, it said, Rabbit. Yeah, yeah. So she went to him and said, Mr. Makai, uh, Mr. Kekai. Kekai, um, you, I'm sure you don't remember me. I was a barrel-shaped little girl. And you taught me to surf. And he teared up. It was yeah. a really moving yeah. moment. No. Yeah. No. He, he uh, was a great influence on my life. And yeah. he, had a, he had a spirit that a lot of the older Hawaiian surfers had. And it was a spirit of sharing. They all wanted to share surfing. And so uh, there'd be times, you know, I'd be on the beach as a young kid, you know, 10 years old. And 
Duke Kahanamoku walked by, hey boy, let's go, and he never called me by Freddie yeah. or anything, even when I was older, he, he, he called me boy, he said, let's go surf, and so, you know, those Hawaiians wanted to take everybody surfing and share it with me. It was kind of like, we're so proud of this, our sport of surfing, we want to share it with you. So Rabbit took a, a great number of young men and women. When, when I was young and started to compete, he used to take me out to Makaha uh, as a young boy and show me the ropes, you know, don't do this, do that. And, uh -huh. and you know, surfing doesn't appear to be, it's a very sophisticated sport. What, <clears throat> what was Duke like? I mean, he was, I mean, he was a pretty a friend of yours, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the best way to describe, yeah, I was, uh, I was close to Duke. I spent the last several years of his life with him because of uh, uh, Kimo McVeigh and the Duke Hanamoku Foundation and, and all the things that went along with it. I traveled with him on goodwill trips for the state, but uh, aloha wasn't a word for Duke of greeting or salutation. Mm -hmm. Aloha was a lifestyle. He, he generally was a man of aloha. He, mm -hmm. He knew mal no malice and no negativity. He, he generally saw the positive in everything. And I, I just got examples. And he never was uh, pedantic with me where he'd tell me, well, do you know this? It was all he, everything I learned from was through just being with him and seeing how he handled other people and uh, how gracious he was as a man. And it, 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 it manifests itself in, in the fact that um, there are a lot of great people in Hawaii in the, in the 20th century, and the one we love the most is Duke. Yeah. And, and uh, did you see a lot of it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I used to, the uh, uh, last couple of years of his life, on many occasions, I'd uh, take him to lunch almost every day. To, to, Where did uh, you have lunch? We used to have it at the Outrigger, but we'd go to other places uh -huh. in Waikiki. Yeah. Uh, uh, he had good it, hamburgers at the Outrigger, yeah. <laughs> my wife tells me. Yeah. They, on, on Fridays, they don't have this anymore. <clears throat> They used to have lao lao and poi, yeah. and so every Friday, because Duke just loved his lao lao, and he yeah. he ate it the old-fashioned Hawaiian way with his fingers. You know, he never touched the utensil yeah. when he ate lao lao and poi. So we'd go down and have lao lao and poi uh, on on Fridays. Uh, but he was a truly joyous man. Well, the, he had several brothers, right? I had two brothers and two, three sisters. Yeah. Were they like him? Oh no, Duke. Yeah. Oh no, Duke had four brothers. There was were, five. Were, were five, they like him? They were all gracious, wonderful men, but not because they didn't achieve the fame that Duke did. No. Uh, they weren't as well known or as. as but he was quite charismatic, wasn't he? He, yeah. in a in a subtle way, yeah. he was charismatic because he had a reputation and people went up to him. But he he wasn't overt, is I uh -huh. guess the best word. He was very subtle, very regal. Yeah. Yeah. So. But you were a terrific com competitive surfer. How did that start? Um, I think I'm a competitive person. Genetics, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, played a little bit of football at Punahou. And uh, I got, my dad, uh, a young boy, took me out to Macau. My brothers and sisters were competitors, and they did very well. My brothers and sisters were all good surfers, too. Uh, and I started entering and ended up doing pretty well in some contests. We'll take a break, but we'll come back to your surfing story. I'll, I'll be here. Yes. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. The, Aloha, the, I'm here with Fred Hemmings, and we were just talking about the beginnings of his surfing career, and I was, uh, was just uh, about to ask him uh, whether the rules of professional surfing, which you were one of the founders of, were as uh, um, strict then as they are now. Um, the concept was the yeah. same, and it, uh -huh. it evolved um, 
evolved throughout the 50s and by the end of the 60s, uh, led by, a, believe it or not, a Peruvian uh, gentleman named Eduardo Arena, there kind of was established a, a universal rule for competition. Ride the biggest wave, the greatest distance, in the most critical section of the wave. And so that meant you'd, you'd wait and you'd, be, you'd only catch the best waves and you ride at the longest distance. And distance included maneuvers on the wave, not uh -huh. just going straight across the surface of the ocean. And then the critical part of the wave, of course, is getting in. And so they, it's judged subjectively by expert judges. But I, uh, you know, I watch these contests occasionally now on the World Pro Circuit, and they have interference rules and little caveats, but that basic concept still applies. Is the judging controversial at all? Never. Well, excuse me, I'm sorry to say that. Very seldom. I, I think there's a universal agreement that uh, when you, if you watch a finals with two guys in it, uh, most people usually agree which guy w w did the better job. Yeah. What was amazing, one of the things that did change is when I was competing, there were uh, six people in, the, in, in a heat. In the finals of the World Championships in Puerto Rico, there were six of us. Now they go man on man, mano on mano, and they, or woman on woman, and they, so it's and, a man on what, man. what difference has that made? Well, it, 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 it makes better for better surfing because you don't have six people competing for the wave and you don't have right. interference and you don't have to worry about. So it, it, it makes it more challenging for the surfers because wave selection is everything. Uh, usually they take your best two or three waves in a, in a half hour or whatever time period there is. So you can catch ten waves, but if you catch ten sevens and your competitor catches three yeah. eights, the guy, the guy with eight, the three eights three is going to be ten sevens, you know? Oh. So, so it, there's a certain amount of luck involved in the, in no, the waves available no, or not? No, I, there is, <clears throat> like everything in life, there's yeah. luck. Uh, but the guy who has the b best ability but also the best judgment, surfing is like most other things in life, being in the right place at the right time. And if you're in the right place in the lineup when the big set comes, I, I, I was in an hour finals in the world championship, and I only caught five waves, and they took the best three. And uh, they had to go back for a tiebreaker to the fourth wave, yeah, but all five waves I caught were the biggest waves. So part of the wisdom is being able to Wait for the big waves, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, why ride yeah. in, in 10 minutes two waves that are going to get you six points when you could ride one that's going to get you eight points? Yeah. So and that, that's kind of the logic that mm -hmm. I competed for under. And uh, But you actually founded a surfing uh, league? Or, yeah, uh, well, I, I, uh, I saw the evolution of the sport. And it, this is a long explanation for a short question. Uh, surfing was was uh, going through uh, growing pains, as I think the culture was in the late 60s, and there was kind of an anti-establishment aspect of surfing as there was with, with, with the culture. Right. You know, uh, smoking marijuana and all, you know, drugs had creeped into the, into the sport, and I didn't agree with that, and uh, I wanted surfers to be respected athletes, and I, so I thought it was the next logical step in the progression and evolution of the sport, and it caught on. And now I think people like Kelly Slater are the, you know, are incredible athletes. Of yeah. Carissa Moore, the young lady, uh, who represent all the best in, in young athletes in, in America. The training seems to be formidable now. For well, that's changed. Athletes. Yeah, when yeah. I, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I never trained. I, I would stay in good physical shape because yeah. I, you know, I, I would definitely not drink or smoke, and especially when competing, but. Um, Nowadays, uh, the, the young people are actually got trainers and they, they exercise and they keep themselves limber. And yeah, it's become very sophisticated and rightfully so because when I started professional surfing, the first contest, the Pipeline Masters, 48 years ago, we gave out a thousand dollars total purse. The first place guy won 500. Well, nowadays, the first place guy can win, win 20,000. So, have the skills improved? Do oh, you it's, it's, it's like yes. space age surfing now. These, these yeah. young people are. Are doing things we, we we couldn't have dreamed of. And are they doing it younger or, or yes. not necessarily? Yeah. Oh no. yeah, There's, they've got yeah. kids competing now that are 10, 11, 12 years old that are doing things that. My and, my son wanted to be an Olympic skier and he was training in Colorado for a year yeah. and he decided he'd already graduated from college and he decided he wasn't going to go forward because he was competing with 14 year olds who didn't know fear. Yeah, no. and that's that's yeah. and that's the, that that is a factor. Thing is, and, it, Surfing. No. and I, I attribute that to experience. <laughs> you get beat up, a, you learn fear real quick. Yes. It's, a, it's a learned experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's fabulous, okay. So uh, what, you then went into politics at one point? What, what took you into politics? Yeah, you know, I love Hawaii, yeah. and I think things could be a lot better here. 
And I, you know, I, I don't talk about politics much anymore. Um, it's the past life, but uh, I think we can do a better job here in Hawaii, and uh, we just keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And uh, you know, things could be better, especially for for the, the working middle class and the uh, the poor. I mean, uh, it's 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 a sad situation. You had one one, one mission you mentioned in the book, uh, which is your, your idea for. Um, sports administration degree. I, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, just describe that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know, because I was in the industry, yeah. uh, one of the biggest businesses in America is sports. Yeah. You know, it, and when you think of sports, you only think of professional football or something. But think how many, every high school in the country has a, a sports yeah. teams, and they all have coaches, and they all have sports equipment. Uh, there's sports medicine. Uh, their, their sport, sports technology, their sports sales of equipment and everything affiliated with, with, with sports. So it's a big business that employs a lot of people. I would say if you added up the economic impact of things like the Kona Billfish Tournament, the triathlon, uh, the Honolulu Marathon, it would exceed agriculture. Now we have a college degree, there's a college agriculture department, but we don't have any even a college of sports and I, I think it makes eminent sense to allow young people to go into some aspect of the sports industry, whether it's coaching or sports medicine or one of the other disciplines in sport, to go get a college degree. It says, I got a, uh, a master's or a bachelor degree in, in sports. Because there are, there are colleges, I mean, uh, 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 several colleges have arts administration degrees. I sure. think HPU is actually sure. explore, exploring one right now. Uh, what, what would be the curriculum? Well, think? it depends what you want. You know, you, yeah. I think you'd have to have, a, in order to get the degree, you'd have to have a broad uh, curriculum of everything, like I said, from coaching to sports technology, uh, sports training. You know, there's all aspects of sports, uh, sports equipment. Law. Uh, sports law. Yeah. Uh, all of those things. Uh, you know, you mentioned something very interesting, sports law. It's real hard to get permits now to have some sport events, you know, because, you know, the event interferes with public uh, right away. Uh -huh. you know, having, there's a big argument every year about getting permits on the North Shore to have the surfing That's events. right, it's a big, yeah. big, and a lot of people, big fight right now. Yeah. Despite, the, despite all of the recognition and uh, revenue that the Honolulu Marathon generates, there's people who complain about that. Uh, you know, I, I can't drive to town at 8 in the morning of the marathon morning because there's all these damn runners in the way, you know. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of things that can be done better here in Hawaii when it comes to sports, yeah, but most importantly is recognizing it is an industry and not just a pastime. What well, is fascinating how many sports can, are identified with Hawaii uh, that either were founded here or, or flourish here or that you know, or, you, you touched or flourish on here better than almost anywhere else. Oh no, you touched on a, yeah. a very, very yeah. uh, salient point to yeah. how uh, Hawaii is the, the birthplace of, of a lot of sports. There was no Honolulu Marathon. No. I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, um, uh, you know, the first Honolulu Marathon that Jack Scaps I ran in the darn thing. Uh, but one day I was coming home from the North Shore and I, I saw these guys running up that long hill from Hollywood. with a running. I, 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 what are these guys? And he said, "Oh, they're in this new thing. It's, it's a first one. It's called a triathlon." Oh, and, and and you know, they, that's right. It was started here, right? Yeah, they yeah. it was started here, and a guy had the rough water swim. Yeah. And then you, you, got, you got out and you ran uh, uh, what essentially was a Kona run, 126 miles. And then you got on the bike and you did a bike ride. And that was the first triathlon. It was birthplaces right here. Professional surfing's birthplaces well, right here. Many countries have ministers of sports, the whole administration of sports. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Maybe that's the way to start it here, you know, is to have yeah. somebody actually a cabinet position in charge of sports. You know. Yeah, you know, you know I. I I, I tend to. I tend you're, to, you're not keen on government. I'm not keen on <laughs> some bureaucrat yeah, sitting in an yeah. office downtown yeah. Honolulu, uh, yeah. you know, administering sports. I'd like to have a free marketplace where you have good rules and have some sort of criteria. Like this, there's an easy solution with this thing about surf contest permits. You set up a grid. Uh, how long has your contest been in existence? What's the total prize money? What's the, how many people get to participate? So you have kind of a criterion for saying, yeah, this is a class A event of international caliber that's giving away a lot of prize money. It's gonna get you know, a permit before some guy that's giving out a, uh, you know, $27 to, to some of his friends in a small event on the North Shore. 
I, if I have a question for you. Um, I've often wondered if, if uh, North Shore surfing has a kind of mythology about it. That you, for instance, you mentioned you, you were in a championship in Puerto Rico. I, I wasn't even aware that there was surfing in Puerto Rico. Oh, it's been the, probably, the best, the, probably the best surfing in the Atlantic. Well, that's my question. Is, is, is there a mythology that Hawaii is the place for surfing simply because it started here? And are there, is there actually a danger of losing that position? No. Uh, we, have, we have individual places that, that garner a lot of coverage, like there's a place in Portugal that breaks two or three times a winter. And it's called Nazare. Well, they have a 100-foot wave there. Wow. We don't ride 100-foot waves in Hawaii. The closest we get is Jaws, maybe 50 or 60. Right. Uh, but when it comes to total surfing, uh, from small waves to big waves to Pipeline to Waimea Bay to Jaws, Hawaii has the broadest spectrum and the best surf in the world. Oh, that's, uh, that's yeah. interesting. Because there's other specialty spots, yeah. you know, that have, yeah. you know, Malibu's got a beautiful, clean wave, but it's cold, cold in one wave. You know, yeah. we, we've got everything. Yeah. And that, I think that's what separates us. We're still the ultimate testing ground of, of surfing. So uh, are you going to write another book? Or I'm thinking, you know, yeah. it's, funny, it's funny you ask that. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of writing a book called Solutions. Oh, yeah. And, and I think that all of Hawaii's problems have solutions. And you know, you know the old cliche about doing the same thing, expecting different results. Yeah. So I think everything from you know, traffic to uh, cost of living and all the things that are affected uh, by policy adapted by government, I think there's solutions to, to our most pressing and basic problems. And uh, I'd like to see them discussed. I'm not saying I got all the answers, but I, I think I have uh, some different ways to look at maybe solving some of these problems. And, and these problems are, are not new at all. You know? And you think they do have solutions? Oh, I'm, I know they do. No. I can, I can rattle off one or two now on traffic. Right. Now, between Aloha, uh, Aloha Stadium and Pearl City, there's two huge ridges that have thousands of houses on each ridge. Yeah. There's no on and off ramps yeah. off, the, off the highway under those ridges. So if you... If so you're how do they get there? You've got to drive down to Pearl City and then circle back and go up the ridge. So that makes all the cars have to get off at Pearl City to circle around and go back. So if you just made on and off ramps just up those ridges, you'd take a huge amount of traffic in the afternoon uh, off H off H1, so simple things like that. We only got a minute, but uh, wh what about the train? Uh, too expensive and not needed. Yeah. Uh, but you know, let me tell you something. Just maybe uh, they it, can run buses on it. Well, it's already it's too late. I think it's a done deal. But the yeah. but, but the other thing is, everybody's talking about the eight billion dollar unfunded future liability of yeah. paying for it. Right now, uh, retirement benefits uh, for state yeah. workers is twenty four billion. Wow. You know, we we got a we're in a big hole yeah. financially. People just don't know about it. Well, that's true in a lot of cities across the country. It's exactly, you're exactly right. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, break off here, but thank you very much, Fred. Oh, my pleasure. Awfully nice to see you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank Good. you.